Hey, good evening, First Assembly, and welcome back to the, the study of the book of Mark, and we're going to be starting in chapter 5 today, and, and then I encourage you guys to continually go over what we cover the weeks pre previous. Uh, we don't always, always don't always go into depth what we're talking about there, uh, just even to time constraints. But I encourage you to go back over and, and then tell me what the Holy Spirit's been telling you, even like in chapter 1 through 4. You know, just keep on refreshing your mind what we're covering and what, what, what Mark was trying to, to tell us in, 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 in his book. Today we're going to talk a little bit about faith. And I, I want to know, can we take faith to an unhealthy level? Because this story, we were encountering probably different kinds of faith acted out. One will come running for help. One will be crawling in embarrassment for help. And one will be begging in desperation for God to move. I can remember growing up in, in you know, in, in the faith and growing up in, in as, as a baby Christian. And, and as I seen a lot of different things that happened. And, and I can remember, you know, sometimes doing a church service where people were trying to sell things because... The preacher or the evangelist at the time would say, you know, if you have faith, you know, plant a seed of faith and you sell land, you sell deeds, you sell, I mean, and you, you give your house away to the church and to give people and, and you plant these things in faith. And I'm not saying it's it's wrong to plant a seed of faith. That's not what I'm saying. But as long as God is telling you to plant a seed, plant a seed of faith. But we need to be careful because even even today that we, there's so much deception going around and, and and we need to be careful what God's Word says and what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. I can remember one time that um, we were in, it was time in the time period that there was a, the Word of Faith movement. And I don't know if you ever heard of the Word of Faith movement. Or maybe you've heard Hyper Faith or Ultra Faith movement. You know, but it was an emphasis on signs and wonders, miracles, it seemed to be. It got to a place that was unhealthy. And you can see where the church has gone through different stages in their life. Uh, even now it's kind of, you can see like it's kind of sporadic all over different churches different denominations they do things a little differently and it's it's kind of weird and, and it can be kind of weird and, and and we need to be careful as a church body is as to what we are feeding ourselves but the word of faith movement grew out of the pentecostal movement in the late 20th century by its founder was ew kenyon who studied the metaphysical new thought teachings of uh, phineas quimby uh, mind science where he basically where name it and claim it came to was combined with Pentecostalism, resulting in a particular mix of Orthodox Christianity and mysticism. So be careful what you what you follow, what you listen to, and you know, even on Sundays we're, we started a couple two part, maybe three part series of um, being deceived. Watch that as believers we don't get deceived by the enemy, and we allow worldly influences in our lives. And at the heart of the Word of Faith movement was a belief that we could force a faith. It was basically a fourth of faith, meaning that I can manipulate it to a place where I can create what what the scriptures promise or what I believe the scriptures promise health and wealth and we're we're, we're not a name it and claim it society and we shouldn't be we shouldn't you know you know I claim that Mercedes Benz or I claim a healing I can remember a time when um, I know that there was a church leader at the time it's, and it was a, it's a quite large church that you would know if you're in, from the area who told a woman that had cancer that her faith was not strong enough and that's the reason why she was not healed. So it, it, we have to be careful even when we, we, we talk to people about some things about faith. Jesus said to the, to the woman, you know, your faith has made you well. And, and, and a lot of times I think sometimes people can take that scripture where he meant it for that woman at that time that people can really stretch that out. In the scriptures we know that there were certain things said at a certain time for a certain period. It wasn't just necessarily for us. But yes, we can we we can we can claim say, Lord, I need you to heal me, or we can claim a healing, but understand either God may heal you right there and then, He may heal you over a time period, or He may heal you by taking you home. And that, and that's sad sometimes that even you know when my brother had cancer, you know we believe that God can heal them, but my faith was, you know, wasn't shaken because I knew God was going to heal him either right there, but that's what we wanted. But God said, no, I'm going to take him home, and he'll be made whole. And we need to be careful even around our faith and what we believe about faith. And, and I brought this all up to you now because we're going to be dealing with faith, and we'll look at some passages of faith. Uh, these stories and passages that we'll be looking at tonight will have some powerful things to say about faith and how we see the dynamic of and the power of God operating. Amen? Let's go to the first one. Chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Then he came on the other side of the sea 
to the country of the Genesenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. It's kind of interesting you think about that. He goes to a Gentile country, and it's interesting, as soon as he gets out of the boat, he sees, or he was approached by a man, not a sane man, but a man. Though his disciples' eyes, I'm thinking, you know, put yourself in her place. They must have thought, what is up with this guy? What's going on? And we know that the condition of the man he had was demon-possessed. Mark tells us that he had an unclean spirit. But not just one, but several. And it's interesting that we need to be careful because uh, the enemy, we know that even from 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, Be sober-minded, be watchful for your adversary, adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone he, to devour. And we, know, we have to understand that. Is there a demon possession today? Yeah, sure there would be. Why wouldn't there be? Um, but we're not going to go back to, can a Christian be uh, possessed? And I said, no, I don't, I don't believe that. But some consider the evil spirits, let's go a little bit about this, are fallen angels and are called demons. Now, there's going to be a couple different camps you're going to face that where do demons come from? What's the difference between a demon and fallen angels? Um, you know, there are some camps that say, well, they're the same, and there are some camps that say they're different. Uh, but understand they serve the same master understand that but demons can be territorial we can see that when you read the scriptures uh but picture this man possessed man at i mean we're talking like i think about i think about the olympics when when the runners are on there and their foot's against that, that pedal that's in the ground and the guy shoots the one two three and he shoots the gun <laughs> i can see him coming like a breakneck speed uh going towards jesus and he drops to his knees and calls him by name Remember when Jesus, back in chapter 4, I believe it was, calms the wind and the waves? And you think about this, the disciples said, who is this man that can do this? Who is this that can calm the winds and the waves? But the demons know who Jesus is. They know who they are dealing with. Men always wonder, demons know. And it says, he lived among the tombs, in verse 3, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. Now we learn... We learn much about the condition of the man, and he lived in a graveyard slash, we'll say, cemetery. We know that he had supernatural strength. He was naked. He was crying out day and night. Now think about this. Imagine Larry living near the, the, you know, the nearest town. Imagine living or even walking near the area, and you hear this man crying out. What was the sign like? What do you think was going on? What was, what was, how, how was this man dealing with torment all the time? How, how do you deal with that? What would you think about? You know, you're, you're sitting down, ready to eat dinner, and all of a sudden you hear this outrageous noise coming out in the wilderness, echoing. But here you see a man, a living, breathing man, living in torment all the time. I can't imagine what they go through. I can't imagine some of the people that live even today who live in a, in a, in a, in a sense in a torment way. Because it says in verse 4 and 5, it says, For he had often been bound by shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. So we know that he had supernatural strength. Night and day among the tombs on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Now listen, this man's dignity, his sanity, his humanity was totally stripped away. All that remained was a shell of a man who was tortured, mind and heart, considered a lost cause. No one, it said, could help him or control him. How many of us have looked at situations in our lives or looked at people in our lives and said, <laughs> you're a lost cause, or that's a lost cause, or this is a lost cause? Jesus doesn't look at it that way. Jesus doesn't look at things as lost cause. Remember, Jesus is in the business to reconcile, redeem, and to bring people in the right relationship and make people whole. In verse 6, it says this, And he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. Crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you doing to me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adore you, adore you. By God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. Now, let me stop real quick here, because I've heard a couple teachings on this. Um... And I'll try to explain it, but I won't go too depth. It says, when, when Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. But let's go back a little further. 
It says, when he saw him, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. Crying out with a loud voice, he said, what, what have you to do to me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you, by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to them, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Do you know you're dealing with unclean spirit and you're listening to a man? Did the spirit always have control over the man? Was the man able to speak? Was he not able to speak? But it's interesting, he says, and he asked, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, for we're many. Now let's go look at the Legion part right there for a minute. The, the language here today, we don't know if the man had one evil spirit or up to 6,000 because a Legion could be counted up to 6,000 soldiers, a Roman Legion. That's why we're, we're looking at it this way. And I believe that the name Legion could be also seen as multiple, maybe maybe not 6,000, but how about this? We'll say a legion, meaning a lot of a lo a lot of demons was inside this man. And, and that's one way we can look at it. But the bottom line here is this. The man that, had, that seemed to have no hope, and there was no hope for him. But I want to see, one, I want to ask you to look on your own. It says, and Jesus asked, what is your name? Was he really asking, because Jesus knew, Jesus knew, Jesus knew there was demons in there. But was Jesus asking the man, what is your name? Meaning, hey, bud, I'm here to help you. What is your name? Now, I'm not saying there's anything heretical or anything like that, but think about this. What is your name? And then we assume because he was asking the demon the name, but we see that the demon did answer. But think about it. Jesus coming up. He wants to see people made whole. He wants to see people made well. And he says, hey, what's your name? And when we're going through a lot of problems in our lives, a lot of torment, or maybe we're going through things kind of like this demonic man, well, what's going on? I see a personal touch that Jesus is coming to meet the man at the grave because everybody else had abandoned him. And here we see Jesus. Jesus wasn't about to abandon him. We started out this chapter talking about faith. And do we see any anyone expressing any kind of faith in this story? Did the disciples say, hey, Jesus, I believe that you can really do this. Is there any hint from the text that anyone has faith about this situation? I don't see any. I see a, I see Jesus with his boys coming off the boat. Maybe there's some other people around and that's not mentioned. And you got to remember in town, this guy was labeled as, you know, he was unhelpable. He was hopeless, a hopeless case. But this story kind of represents a mystery of faith because we don't see it in this story. But what we see is the power of God manifests itself out without any apparent of faith from anyone. We just see Jesus responding to an immediate need. There was a need. There was a man who was demon-possessed, who's been forgotten, who's been ignored, who has been uh, forgotten or uh, who, who deemed you know unhelpable. But yet we see the power of God delivering this man from this demonic spirit and setting him free. Could it be that maybe Jesus seen maybe Jesus seen somehow what we can't see faith in the man when he fell to the knees saying, God, I, I want these things out of me? We don't know. You know, because it says he begged him earnestly afterwards not to send him out of the country. He's talking to the demons now because now he's in a conversation with these things. But I, I look at the first verse and it says he came on the other side of the, of the country and Jesus stepped out of the boat and immediately there met him at the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. It's interesting when we kind of when we read the scriptures and, and you go back and you pull things apart because the demons knew they were in trouble right off the bat. But part of me when I read this I think of myself if I was the man and I seen Jesus, even though I had all these voices going on in my head, was there a way for me to get to that place to say, Jesus, will you help me? Will, will, you, will you get these guys out of here? And it says, Now a great herd of pigs was feeding on the hillside, and he begged them, Send us into the pigs, let us enter into them. It's kind of interesting why they wanted to go into the pigs. but So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered into the pigs and the herd. Numbering about 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned into the sea. Now you kind of get, you get a feel if there's 2,000 pigs. So you could probably, maybe in your thoughts you're saying, well, there's 2,000 demons. Not clear, but you kind of get that idea. 
but there was a lot of demons in this man. Uh, the herdsmen fell and told in the city and in the country, and all the people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had been had legion sitting there clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Now it's interesting, the times people heard what was going on out of the cemetery, and they came to see the demon-possessed man with a sound mind clothed and normal. But you remember what we talked about earlier. This man had like no dignity, dignity at all. He had he had, he had he had nothing. He was stripped down. He was just a shell of a man. But now we see when Jesus comes on the scene, and Jesus takes by this man and restores him in right, and he receives his dignity back. He comes back with a sound mind. He's acting properly. He's clothed. He's normal. He's the way he's supposed to be. And a lot of times we think. You know, Jesus can't help me out of my situation. We look at a situation that's hopeless, and that's not the case. God can take care of every situation. But we need to be in a place where we're humble and surrendered and saying, God, help me. And it seemed like in this story that somewhere in in this story, this man knew to come running. Some would say, well, that's the demons just coming to bow before the God because they knew who Jesus was. That's true. That's true. But I think some part of me thinks that that man somehow was in there that Jesus seen, hey, crying out. A lot of times, sometimes, you know, Jesus sees in our hearts that we don't, you know, we don't even have to say the words. He sees our heart and he knows, God, help me. And it says in verse 16, and those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from the region. <laughs> now think about this. Jesus comes on the scene, gets it, takes care of a man who is demon-possessed, who you guys have deemed hopeless, uh, worthless, not worth anything, can't can't help them, uh, always causing issues, and yet Jesus comes and helps them, and you're telling them, hey, we need you to leave. Why did they ask Jesus to leave? Why did they ask him to depart? One, was their faith, was, how was their faith? Did they ever expect a man to, see, to get help? Where was their faith? Or, you know, if these were all Jews, what were they doing raising pigs? Well, they're not Jews raising pigs. However, they were in a Gentile country. Uh, this was actually a Greek country called the Capitalists, where they, you know, where maybe they weren't Jews. But losing 2,000 pigs doesn't settle well with, with the people. They don't applaud Jesus for healing the man. They look at it as a terrible plight. Instead, they ask him, hey, we need you to leave, bud. They respond in fear. But also, they respond in rejection. Would a group of people reject Jesus over over a group of pigs? If they would die, what would you think? Or if he came on and made, you know, think about this. These did. Their value system was so messed up. Just like the miracle of the man with the withered hand. Remember that story? And Jesus pointed out to the Pharisees concerning the sheep over the people. It's it's sad when you see when people put value, they devalue the human being over their product. Here they are more concerned with their money than they are this man's life. Listen, I, I I get it. You know, granted they were they were upset about losing their business as the pigs plunge into the plunge. But what about the man? What about this man being restored? But they said they say they tried to bind the man or slash possess man Satan with no excess. But Jesus handled, say, six thousand demons with no issues. Maybe they were mad because the visit the man was scary and business, you know, was they just wanted to get away, get him away. Maybe they're saying, you know what, Jesus, you're really bad for business. We you need to get out. What's sad is sometimes, I'm not saying liberals, but all liberals, some people, liberals, place values on pigs higher than man. Do we, do we, do we value our our fellow man? But we see the power of God and we see him do and accomplish his own will. What was the faith, what what about the faith of the disciples in this story? What about the faith of the man? who maybe had none or was not seen or was it seen 
Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 says this, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we ever ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him glory in the church in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. What, what is God is saying here is, listen, God is able to do more than we ask. I'm talking about prayer. When we're asking for a miracle for someone or, or, or they need a touch, God, I need to lift this person up or I need to lift this country up. God is able to do more than we think. Let me ask you this. Also, if God is able to do more than we think, do we limit God with our minds and our thoughts? Think about this. We come into a hopeless situation like this man on the tombs in our minds. Think about the disciples that are pulling up on shore. You've got to remember, the town's already deemed this man. It, it's in a hopeless situation. Here you see the disciples coming. And I'm hoping they're thinking, hey, God can really move in this. But what were they thinking also? But what about us? You know, um, when we face a, a hopeless situation, do we say there's nothing that can be done? You know? I think those disciples thought, and the others thought, that the man at the tomb was a lost cause. There was no hope, no future for him. Just wait until he dies. Just let him die, and he'll be better. But see, the problem is this, is God is able to do more than we can ask or what we can think. You know, I think of all that we can, when we look at a situation like the man at the tomb, sometimes big or, or great size, and we have already deemed there's no hope. How about a marriage that's falling apart? How about your body? Maybe you're dealing with cancer or maybe you're dealing with a sickness or maybe your family's falling apart and we sit back and we say, God, you know what, this seems so hopeless, but you know, we need to be in a place where we're saying, God, here's my hopeless situation, what I deemed a hopeless situation and I need you to, inter to intervene. Lord, I need you to touch my marriage. Lord, I need you to touch my body. Lord, I need you to touch my family. You know, you, you, you don't have, you don't have the words to say. You don't speak these words in faith. You say, you don't got it, Lord. I, I, I just, I don't have it. I don't, I believe this is a hopeless situation. And God's saying, listen, give it to me. Give it to me. Trust me. Trust me. How about praying for our country, for a miracle? Look at it. Look at our country. You know, sometimes when we say, listen, we, we talk about this even on services, you know, extend your hands to the north, the south, and the east, and the west, and people just get up to do it. Oh, yeah. Pray for your country, but you know we sit there and we pray for our country, but under our breath we're saying, "I don't think this is going to work. I don't think our country will ever change." Where is our faith? Where is our faith in thinking of what and how God thinks? Imagine, you know, if we would all fall on our knees, and if we all would humble ourselves, and if we all would repent of our sins, do you don't think God's going to answer? And here you see this demon-possessed man who people have left hopeless. Now think about these people you see on the streets or. Maybe the situation in our country, we are, oh, it's hopeless, it's the way it's going to be, it's always going to be like that. But what about if we start standing and believing in faith that God's going to move in that situation? That God will intervene on the behalf of people? Listen, the lesson here in this story is that when we face situations that seem hopeless, let our faith rise up and look beyond what we think and let God deal with it. You know, think about the guys in the storm. They're thinking doom and gloom. But what do they do? Boom. God deals with it. God had to show them how to deal with it. Amen. So let your faith rise up. Even when your life stories or the storms or the situation or circumstances seem it's so gloom and dooming, glooming. And start giving it to God. And start let your faith rise up. And say, God, I need you to move in this situation. And stand firm in God in faith. Because it says in verse 18 through 20, as he was getting into the boat, the man had been possessed with the demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but to say to him, go home to your friends and you tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the capitalists how much Jesus had done for him. Everyone marveled. Now you got to remember though, when you think about it, he said, everyone marveled. But what about the guys that got mad at him told him to get lost because you destroyed my business with all the pigs? Honestly, we no matter how much heckling you get or how much people want you to get away or you don't want you to talk about Jesus, we need to bloom where God sends us. Jesus' ministry was was very fruitful and he, and he multiplied. But before we go on, do we limit God in our minds? Do we... Do you see faith in this story of the possessed man? Because someone will say, without faith, nothing is going to happen. Now, now think about this. Then someone would say, well, he fell at Jesus' feet, didn't he? 
Well, yes, he did. But if we say that God can only move in our faith, doesn't that strip God, strip away God's sovereignty to do his own will to move? God moves powerfully and sovereignly in the midst of this story in a situation where it almost seems like faith is silent or absent, we'll say. Where at other times we see Jesus said, your faith has made you well. And we're going to see that because really you, you don't see it in the, just in this short story. But we, we, don't, we only see what's written. But do we see, maybe the man had faith. Maybe the man did say, we don't, which was not written down. We don't know. But what we see is God sovereignly moving. Think about this as we move forward in the next session. And these two stories, the next two stories are wonderful. And they're, and they're kind of woven together. They, they're, they're, they are. They're woven together. And uh, it's pretty interesting how these stories, they really do fit together. Both people, now listen, both people must have heard of Jesus at some time. And what he was doing and who Jesus was. They must have got a little bit of them. But you think about this though, is when, like, when they both heard of Jesus and what he was doing, did they question who he was? Because you understand there was part of people doing, kind of trying to do the same thing, but they failed and they looked like they failed. You know what I mean? They would say, well, they're trying to heal people and it never happened. And so even even like today, there's people who are true and they're genuine. And there's people who are kind of the, the fakes and the charlatans that we have to be careful of. Did they say, eh, I don't know. Is Jesus good? I don't know. But see, we know something had happened because... It got personal for both. You know, we don't know where their faiths were before we hear but we're hearing this story. But now we see that there's a man named Jairus and a woman who had an issue with blood. And we know that Jairus comes up and he's trying to convince Jesus. Hey, listen, dude, Jesus, you got to save my daughter, man. you got to save my daughter. And then we're going to see the other side of a coin where a woman who gets, it's an embarrassing situation for her. Because she's really not supposed to be on outside. She's deemed unclean in society. And yet, she does whatever it has to. She doesn't care. She, she, she's at her wit's end, maybe. And she and she goes out and grabs the whole Jesus. So let's get into the story. Verse 21 and 22, it says, When Jesus had crossed over again, or crossed again into the boat on the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Now, that's, that's pretty good. Everywhere he went, people people see genuineness. People see genuineness, and, and they, want, they want to be around him. And they came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus, by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet. Go back. <laughs> Demonic man fell at his feet. Because that's why I was thinking, maybe this dude up here showed a little fit of faith. Maybe he's seen Jesus and wanted healed. Here you see Jairus now, another man, fell at his feet. But he's in his right mind. Now Jesus had different people falling at his feet. Now this one is different for a different reason. It probably was not easy for Jairus to come to Jesus publicly and ask for help. It was a gutsy move that could have jeopardized his position in the Jewish community, but he was in a desperate situation. And have you ever been in a, in a place that you were desperate? And here you put yourself in Jairus's place. Maybe it wasn't one of your kids, or maybe it wasn't one of your grandkids, but you know, place that, put yourself in a desperate situation. And in verse 23, it says, and implored him earnestly saying, my daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be well and live. Now, can you imagine what was going on in his mind? Can you imagine his thoughts? You know, I can imagine sometimes when my kids were growing up and they were getting hurt and they were bleeding and they were hurting and, and you know, it was just out. It was out of, out of my control, out of my hands. And here you see that, um, in my mind, I'm thinking of my, for my kids, all the worst thing that's going to happen. And I can see with Jairus thinking the same thing. And let's go back to Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now in him who's able to do far abundantly than we think or ask, according to the power at work within us, to him glory in the church with all Christ Jesus throughout generations forever and ever. We need to start thinking that in a bad situation, when you cry out to Christ, things can happen and will happen when we put our faith in him. Because it says in verse 24, And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. Now take note that there was people surrounding Jesus all the time. There was a massive, uh, a massive of humanity, group of crowded people moving towards Jairus' home. Now think about this. Even think about the riots, you know. No, this is probably bad. Think about the streets, totally filled with people. Okay? Here you have Jairus. Grab a hold. Come on, Jesus. 
we gotta get going, we gotta get going. And crowds don't normally move fast. And there, and and I can see Jairus is thinking in mind, come on, Jesus, we gotta hurry up. I know people are touching you. I know, I know, I, I know this is all, you know, but my daughter's, my daughter's sick. My daughter's dying. I need you to move. But we know they're not moving fast because we know that there's a woman of an issue of blood who's tied into this story is crawling on her hands and knees to get up to touch the hem of God's garment, to touch Jesus. In this next section, we're going to see Jairus a little bit closer. Can you imagine what's going through his mind? The crowd is holding Jesus up, and every moment can shorten his daughter's life and for her healing. Can you imagine the faith crisis that, that Jairus had is having right now? And Jesus stops for the crowd from moving. Verse 25. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and who had suffered under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. Now you see a woman who went to man for all of her ways to get healed. Now I'm not saying don't go to doctors, but I'm saying this is a woman at this time went to the physicians they, and she is broke. I mean, she spent all of her money. She's, she's destitute. She's broke. And they could not help her. She put her faith in the physicians first. And everything went bad. No help. But it's interesting sometimes that we have to hit rock bottom before we turn to the face of God. But it says it grew worse. She didn't get better. And she had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garments. For she said, if I touch his garment, I will be made well. Now Mark tells us that she, what she was thinking here. Now, where did she come up with, thinking, or with touching the garment? Why didn't she come up and, and touch his hand? Maybe she said, why didn't she say, well, you know what? What if I would look into his eyes? What would I would do that? I would get healed. Now, just real briefly, the hem of a garment had an authority. There was a, a, or a fringe or a border or uh, the, the, a border robe. In, in, in the Greek word, it's just, it, it just at the bottom of the robe. But it carried an authority. Like a husband could divorce his wife by cutting the hem off of her robe. So, and, and that a nobleman could authenticate his name with a mark of the hem as he, you know, kind of on, on a clay tablet. So he would get like a clay tablet that's soft and if he had given authority, he could, he could press it on there and it, the mark would transfer over onto the clay. The hem was considered a, a symbol of rank in ancient Israel. It would, had legal responsibilities. But putting that aside, I look at the woman and she, as she's crawling on her hands in embarrassment, because remember, everyone that touched her would be deemed unclean because she's unclean because of her blood issue. She personally touched and trusted Jesus for the healing. And it was almost, you knew, you knew when she, when she went up and says, if I touch his, even his garment, okay, meaning if I even, if, even if I don't have the chance to go up and hug him, even if I don't get the chance that he don't turn around and grab a hold of me, I know if I, if I, my faith is in him, but even if I touch his garment, I will be made, made well. Now, does Jesus have magic, magic clothes? No, Jesus doesn't have magic clothes. But he's telling us about her faith, and he's telling us that what would be the contact point of her faith? It was, deter it was the determination in her heart of what is necessary to seeing things happen. She felt, all I must do is touch his clothes. Now, Jairus wanted Jesus to lay hands on his daughter, but Jesus did not have to lay hands on her. He would just have to say the word. Remember, some of the other stories go, your servant is made well or made whole. Different people have different contact points of faith with Jesus. Jesus could have healed her just by saying the word, but, he, but it shows on her faith in him, and her contact point was the him. You know, she went to that place. In some translations, it says virtue flowed from him. You know, she she did she knew she said all I gotta do is grab a hold of him. I know that he's gonna. I know he's oil oil me. Did Jesus did Jesus at any time criticize Jairus for saying, "I have to do what? I have to travel where? And whose house do I have to go into?" No. God meets people right where you're at, 
and God will meet you, me and you right where we're at. Here you see Jairus desperate for his daughter to be healed. His faith is being stretched. Here you have a woman who has nothing left. Her dignity has gone. She's, honestly, she's probably embarrassed that she's on her hands and knees crawling in a desperate way to get God to heal her. God, Jesus, I know you can do it, but only, only if I just touch you, touch your hem, I know I'll be made whole. Now, the bleeding issue can, one can only assume, but we're not really sure what exactly what it caused. We can, we can assume of it. But in the midst of this healing, we, we, we see a tormented father wanting Jesus to hurry up so his daughter can be healed. We get that way sometimes too, don't we? Jesus, I need you to move now. But sometimes we learn through the process that we go through to get that healing. Now, think about Jairus is waiting for Jesus to get home to his daughter, right? The process for him is maybe, you know what? Jairus is going to grow in faith in Christ and what Christ can do. Maybe Josh is going to learn how to have patience in God and see God move, to trust in God. You know, then you have a fearful woman who wants to slip secretly and not to be seen because of the bleeding made her, according to the law, like I said, ceremonially unclean. When unclean people touched, when an unclean person touched something, it would make the other thing unclean. People uh, like this or deemed unclean would stay away from other people. It's just truth. Leviticus 15, 25 through 27 says, If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge she shall be continued to in uncleanliness, as in the days of her impurity she shall be unclean. Every bed where she lies, all the days of her discharge shall be to her as the bed of her impurity. And everything on which she sits shall be unclean, as in uncleanliness of her menstrual impurity. And whoever touches these things shall be unclean, and shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until evening. So she had a problem here because wherever wherever Jesus went, there seemed to be a large cry. Now she is breaking all the rules. Where but think about this. Where was her strength that she was losing blood for twelve years? A lot of times when you think about it, when you lose your blood, you lose strength. You lose, you lose strength. You know? But think about this. Where is your heart? And is it reaching out to God? So here you see this woman in a desperate place, losing blood. We don't know how much. No strength. No money. She's broke and she's hurting. And she says, I'm going to grab a hold of Jesus. And I'm going to fight until I get my healing. I'm not going to give up until I grab a hold of him. And I don't care what the people say around me. They may say I'm crazy or nuts, but I'm going to do it until I get what I need from God. I want that healing. And it says in, in, in verse 30, it says, And Jesus perceived him that power had gone out from him. It means that he turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And the disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? Because he knew that there was a genuine faith in her, in, his, uh, in, 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 in life. He, he knew it. And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear, trembling before him, or fell be, fell down before him, sorry. And he told him the whole story. So another one, 33 people fell down before Jesus. Tells us about what, getting your healing is, is falling down before Jesus. Now, may not necessarily mean you, you if you are not able to drop to your knees, but falling down in your heart and humility. And he said to his daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Why didn't Jesus say this? Hey, my power made you well. Go. He says, your faith has made you well. In this case, this is how Jesus had healed her. And it's not done in every person that way. And and sometimes people grab a hold of that and say, well, he did it for her. He, did it. he may, but he may not because it was specific for that woman at that time. And it says, while he was still speaking, there came... From the ruler's house, someone who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? So think about this. Here you go. You got Jairus probably. He's already frantic. And I think maybe this was a breaking point. Jairus, it's it's over. She's gone. Don't trouble the master no more. She is dead. And there's nothing you can do about it. And here was Jairus getting angry at the cry. Was Jairus getting angry at Jesus? Was Jairus getting angry at the woman who stopped him because she was desperate for healing. But yet I think we know as we read the story that, that God is still moving in Jairus' situation and Jairus' faith has got to grow. 
And a lot of times in our situations, we when we come to something like this, we don't know why there's a, a pay, there's there's a, why Jesus is doing it the way He did it. But there's reasons why there's times we have to wait. There's times when we have to go through things because at the end, Jairus's faith is going to be so much stronger, and this woman is going to be restored totally. And even even like the the, the man at the cemetery, the the the, the, the demonically uh, possessed man, we really got to see what's going on in this story, and place yourself inside these stories. But it says, but overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, "Don't fear, only believe. Have faith." I mean, basically, listen, dude, have faith, believe. And he, and he allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Now they finally showed up at Jairus', at Jairus and Jairus' heart must have sank. Oh man. He's probably thinking, well, oh, like these guys, did Jesus never really, did he ever heal anybody? I mean, think of what's going through this mind. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing. Now let us stand back in the day, I don't think I have it today, but back today, they had professional mourners crying for your loss who would, would, would mourn alongside you. They would almost be like, I mean, I don't want to say wedding crashers, but they would be almost like you go to the funeral and you just, you mourn with people. Hey, we're, we're, we feel what you're going through. But these are professionals. And we know they didn't really care about the person. They were there just for the job. They were There was no emotional loss for them. So understand uh, uh, that they're going just to support you in a sense, but they have no feelings for that person. Or, not, or they may, but here, you know, because here, you know, they don't. Because it says when they had entered in at verse 39, and he said, then why are you making commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. See, at first, they were crying. Okay, because we read that verse, a verse earlier. And now they jump to laughing. How? Remember, they're a little professional. So, this is the, it's a job to them. They're not really there. They're just, they were basically being hired to just mourn, to go mourn. And verse 40 says, they laughed at him, and they put him aside. But he put them all outside and took the child's father, mother, and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Now, he put them on the outside. Remember I talked about earlier about inside people and outside people, or inside Christians and outside Christians? Outsiders laughed at the face of God's power and would not witness it at work. The insiders see the power of God's work and are, are blessed to see it. He says, taking her by the hand, Talithia Kumai, which means little girl, I say rice, you know. In Aramaic language, it says little lamb, wake up. Understand that God only brings life. Only God can bring life. 